So now, with that, I'd like to introduce Creel, who is the Group Chief Marketing and Operations Officer at Asiata Group. That's, as I just learned, 216 million customers. Let's show appreciation for Creel in making time in his busy schedule to share his insights. Thank you so much, Creel. <laughs> I'm going to get it all set up. So just give me a sec to uh, work out where I've put your presentation. Yeah, yeah, you can take that out. Didn't have any breakfast this one on. <laughs> Great, we got it. Very good. Okay, thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Cairo. I am from the Asiata Group. Um, Actually, the, the, the gender and, and the introduction from, from Alan is not quite accurate. I, I was the group chief marketing and, uh, and operations officer for the Exiata group, but that was when we started the conversation for me to attend this, uh, this conference. I have since uh, moved on to a different role within the Exiata group. I now look after old and new businesses. So these are the digital services portfolios, kind of the, the new, the next generation businesses for a telco. Uh, I look after the digital commerce um, uh, entities that we have, digital money, um, mobile advertising, uh, our entertainment business. Uh, I even look after our uh, big data company. So, so all the stuff that is kind of new with, an, uh, with a telco, uh, that's the bit that I'm now looking after. Um, just a very quick summary on the Asiata group. I'll just put this down. Very quick summary on the Asiata group. Some of you may not know it. Um, uh, RM stands for Ringgit Malaysia. We're actually based out of uh, Malaysia, but we operate in uh, nine different countries, probably about 15 different subsidiaries right now, um, covering you know, all the way sort of from uh, the western side, Pakistan, going all the way to the east, Cambodia, and probably most of the countries in between as well. Uh, we have about 260 million customers that we serve um, through brands like Idea in India, uh, Excel in Indonesia, M1 in Singapore, uh, Cellcom in Malaysia, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have businesses uh, that are a little bit more infrastructure related, like e.co down in the bottom left, uh, and then more kind of new type businesses uh, like the ones that I've just described. Um, so what Alan had asked me to do was to effectively share some perspectives uh, from a telco on service innovation. Um, and rather than giving you a lot of data, because you can pick up the data from Gartner, from IDC, from you know, GSMA and whatnot, uh, I thought I'd just share sort of a few themes and observations on, of service innovation within a telco. Um, but before I do that, maybe just for me to kind of get to know the audience a little bit, and then it helps with the speed networking later on, um, just a few, a, a little quick experiment, a couple of questions, and then I kind of know who, who I'm talking to. So, uh, first question I have, does anyone know who Felix Kelbuck is? Wow, okay. Anyone heard of PewDiePie? Wow, oh, a gentleman at the back, he knows PewDiePie. <laughs> so PewDiePie, just in case you don't know, is the most watched channel on YouTube, 32 million followers. Uh, all this guy, his name is Felix Kelbuck, by the way, all this guy ever does is he plays games, right? and he records them and he puts them on YouTube. And last year, 2013, when he was probably only averaging about 10 million viewers, uh, he earned four million US dollars just doing that, playing video games. Uh, this year, he's probably gonna earn about eight to nine million US dollars just playing video games. And there are sponsorship deals coming and so on and so forth. That's the kind of business that we're dealing with. Actually, second question. Um, anyone have Tinder installed in their smartphone? <laughs> ah, now we're talking. <laughs> Anyone use Tinder when they landed in Istanbul last night? <laughs> okay. So, no. so for those of you who are not laughing, please install Tinder in your, in your smartphone, then you'll know what I'm talking about. So four quick themes that I want to share with you. Again, this is a telco's perspective. You may not agree with this, but you know, certainly in the breakout sessions later on or in the break, uh, come challenge me. Um, it's, again, my perspectives, our perspectives, you don't have to agree with it. Uh, theme number one, this is a Kodak moment. Now, I bought my first digital camera back in 1998. Anyone has a guess what brand it was? Sorry? Um, no. <laughs> Close. 
Megan. No, actually, Megan. it was a Kodak. So my first mobile phone was actually a Kodak. Oh, sorry, my first digital camera was actually a Kodak. Could only take probably about 16 pictures. And then I have to download them, and I have to do all sorts of stuff with them. But that was back in 1998. And they've actually not done much since then. In fact, actually, the guys who have innovated on that are you know, Apple and Samsung and you know, Nikon, Canon. Um, Sony actually was one of the first innovators around the digital camera space. Um, if I think about kind of our industry right now, I think we're in that Kodak moment. I think that if we don't do anything about it, the industry as we see today, from a telecom's perspective, again, you don't have to agree with me, will be all but gone before the end of this decade. All the businesses that we see right now, voice, SMS, IDD, Roman, et cetera, they're dead. They will be dead in the next five years. My, my point of view, you guys may not agree, but hopefully you can debate a little bit over the, the next, uh, next couple of days. The second theme is this, and I think Alan actually raised this a little bit about kind of building collaborative ecosystems. Uh, this, by the way, is a picture of David and Goliaths, and I realize actually there are a lot of Davids in this room. Uh, we, unfortunately, are a Goliath. We're big, we're strong, we're a large, giant, cash-generating machine that will fail to see the strengths that a David will bring. We, um, well, I, I, I don't know whether you guys know this, I'm sure a lot of you will know the story, but the moment before uh, uh, Goliath met his doom, he was still beating on his chest plate, you know, bragging about his, his victory records and so on and so forth, uh, not really aware, and actually still very confident that he'll swat this little fly away, right? Unfortunately, his confidence, his ego led to his downfall. Um, I would say that as a telecom operator, if we don't, learn from these kind of mistakes, we're doomed to the same kind of failures. I'll give you a couple of examples from the Exiata group. About three years ago, a small, <laughs> a small Swedish music streaming company was introduced to the Exiata group. Uh, at that stage, by the way, Exiata had just come out from record profit growth, uh, record revenue growth. So we're going, oh, what, what do you guys do? Music streaming, what's that? You know, from Sweden? I mean, you know, we typically work with people from maybe the Valley. Sweden, right? So we walked away. Now, I, I learned a couple of weeks ago that this little small Swedish company has actually uh, earned more in royalty revenues than iTunes. We passed out on a wonderful opportunity. Another one, by the way, and this one you'll like. Um, a, I guess, transport booking company that starts with the letter U and ends with the letter R uh, came to us shortly after that, by the way. And they wanted to work with us because you know, we have location-based services that can actually help them with their business. We have direct carry billing that can actually help them because in our markets, there's no, not a lot of credit cards, so that's a very good payment platform. Um, they wanted to work with us. And in fact, they were actually offering an equity stake of this company. Now, back then, the last letter in the valuation was M, not B. And we walked away from it. So if we don't do something about this right now, we're going to be doomed to the same set of failures uh, that, that a, a Goliath would have. I just realized I'm actually wrong. There's a clock here. I'm running out of time. OK. Um, next one. It's all underneath your land. Now, this is a story which is actually a little bit more peculiar to Malaysia. Uh, in the east coast of Malaysia, there are actually a lot of tobacco farmers. Right? Um, and back in the late 80s, early 90s, when Malaysia started privatizing their oil and gas company, the, the private oil and gas company basically started knocking on the doors of all these tobacco farmers and said, you know, based on our satellite scans, you guys are sitting, your land is sitting on top of oil reserves. And actually, for most part of, of those guys, they actually didn't do anything about it. You know, well, I'm 60 years old, you know, I'm going to retire soon, I don't really want to do anything with this, I like the lifestyle that I have right now, so nothing, right? Um, we're exactly like that. We have assets. A telco operator has a lot of assets, you know, and I mentioned some of those that, you know, the likes of the Ubers and the Spotify's of the world we're looking for. And we have those assets, and if we don't do anything about it, that's fine. But if we don't do anything about it soon enough, those guys, the Spotify's of the world, the Ubers of the world, will find alternatives to the assets that we actually have. And therefore, all the value that we can bring to enable this ecosystem, to enable the digitizing world right now, in retail, in financial services, in transport and logistics, they'll all go away. And we'll be doomed to the failure that I described right at the start, i.e. our business will disappear in the next five years. So I think we need to kind of start doing something about this. My final one, and this is, I just like this picture, so I decided to kind of find a way to bring this theme into it. The rise of the machines. 
Um, I'm sure you guys have all heard about the Internet of Things, M2M, and so on and so forth. Now let me, again, a little bit of an experiment, and, and you don't have to raise hands or anything like that, but let's just start by imagining an architecture, an infrastructure architecture of a typical telco line now. And, and chances are you'll have well, you know, your network layer, your OSS, your BSS, your billing system, CRM, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now on top of that right now, overlay how you think a telco operator is um, taking advantage of Internet of Things, of M2M. -M. Chances are you'll have you know, new boxes now attached to all these old boxes that I just talked about, the OSS, the BSS, and so on and so forth. Well, let's start again. Let's kind of just erase all of that away. And then let's start with the idea that you're now building an architecture just for machines. It's going to be a lot simpler, wouldn't it? It's probably just the network layer, a sort of a box in between, and then all the machines that it gets connected to the, towards the end. Relatively simple structure. Now, here's an observation. Um, anyone from GSMA here? No one from GSMA, I guess, right? So uh, if, you if you listen to sort of some of the things that they're saying about, um, actually anybody uh, talking about sort of I IoT M2M, um, within the next five years, we will have about 80 billion connected devices. That's a very big number. But here's the other thing about that number. It's an order, it's actually more than an order of magnitude higher than the number of mobile subscribers. Our entire business model as a telephone operator is set up to connect to a mobile phone subscriber. We have call centers. Call centers are not much use when the other part of that line is a machine. Now, if it's an order of magnitude higher than that, and if there are simpler ways of doing this, wouldn't we think that there'll be new players that will emerge, the, the kind of the new mobile operators, if you like, that's just designed to cater for machines, no longer for humans? Again, if we don't change as telecom operators, our lunch is going to get eaten. So there you have it. Those are my sort of four key points. I was told by Alan Quill, and he told me he was actually a time czar. I had to keep it to 10 minutes so that we can then sort of open it up for a Q&A. My four um, themes are simply this. You know, we are at this Kodak moment. We've got to do something about it. Service innovation is key. If we don't, you know, if we don't evolve, we'll perish. Service innovation is, is not only necessary, it's actually crucial for our survival as an industry. Build ecosystems, not ecosystems. Don't pump your, don't, don't, don't sort of bang your fist against your chest, especially for a telecom operator. Work with the Davids. There are plenty of Davids in this room. We like to work. We are open and exploring uh, um, opportunities to work with you. The other thing I would say about sort of ecosystem is that traditional competition, right, like in Malaysia where we have, or in our region where we have the Singtel group or the Talano group, you know, I no longer see them as competition. I see them as partners in building a collaborative ecosystem because the new competition is not necessarily them. The new competition is somewhere else. So when we think about building ecosystems, it's actually as much building partnerships with them. Um, all underneath your land, we do have assets and we gotta make use of it, otherwise it's, it's gonna go to waste. And then of course, the rise of the machines, thinking very differently about the business model that we have right now, uh, because otherwise it'll get transformed for us. So there you have it. So thank you very much. Um, questions? Yeah. Alan said this was a tough group. <laughs> That's better. Hi, Karel from Orange. So, um, actually, you, you discussed what the uh, industry is going into. Uh, but what are you doing at Axiata specifically to address that issue? Uh, do, you, do you have uh, you know, specific uh, ecosystems that you're trying to build, specific uh, new uh, uh, industry uh, services that you, you want to focus on? Yeah, uh, uh, well, two, two things. One is uh, the next speaker um, is actually from my team as well. He's actually going to talk very specifically about some of the things that we're doing on the enablement front. But it, it, broadly speaking, uh, if you like, we're kind of following a two-prong strategy. Um, the, the first prong or the first uh, uh, sort of a set of initiatives are businesses that we're trying to build 
uh, that to a certain extent enhance our core business. Now, question for you guys is, well, what are we doing that? Well, to a certain extent, we're borrowing resources for them, we're borrowing assets from them, so we've got to kind of find some ways to deliver back to it. Um, and then secondly is, uh, the, the second prong is actually all about leveraging those assets, right? The kind of assets that the Ubers and the Spotify's are looking for to build new sources of value, not of revenue necessary, but certainly of value, right? So uh, to get onto some very specifics, uh, we have uh, entered into some partnerships to build digital commerce sites. Uh, we feel that digital commerce is actually a beautiful one for us because we are effectively matching buyers and sellers. Both of them are actually part of our customer group. You know, in Indonesia, uh, we have 68 million customers there. When we set up our e-commerce site, um, it took us, what was that, six months um, to get to two times the volume of transactions that the Rocket Internet guys took eight months over four countries to achieve, including Indonesia. So it's simply because we have 68 million customers there. You know, it's very easy for us to do that. So that's one. Uh, digital advertising, you know, everyone's kind of doing that anyway. Uh, payment. Payment is actually very closely related to our core business because we, you know, because our markets are largely uh, prepaid markets. Uh, there's a lot of top, top up transactions that we do. It's also a largely um, uh, credit, uh, sorry, unbanked population. So, so that's actually very much in line with what we do. And then finally on the entertainment side. So those are the four verticals that we're pursuing directly. On top of that, we actually have uh, an enablement business that will allow the likes of the Ubers and the Spotify's and so on and so forth to plug in. It's effectively just you know, a, a multitude of APIs that we're opening up to, um, uh, to these ecosystem players. Uh, next presenter, Amos, will, will, will talk more specifically about that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Christoph from uh, Huawei. So you just mentioned a few verticals uh, which would be part of the Asieta portfolio, right? Yeah. And then as a last point, an enablement business, but where do you think most of the value is? Is it in the business that you're going to brand Asiata, or is it in the enablement side of it? Uh, over the short to medium term, I think a lot of the value will come from businesses that we create that will then enhance the core business. The core business, like it or not, is still 99.5% of the enterprise value. So anything that we can do to raise ARPUs, to reduce churn, to increase customer acquisition will help, right? So we're doing, if you like, if you think about this, right? So we, when we've tracked the data, anyone that uh, signs up to a mobile wallet uh, and actively uses it, that cohort's churn effectively reduces to zero, right? And this is, this is in markets where we have churns up to, you know, what, 24, 24%. So it actually does add a lot of value, right? So, um, so I, I guess, you know, in the short to medium term, that's where a lot of the value is. In the longer term, though, I think it's all these new businesses, right? Um, you know, digital, uh, well, in, in our market, for example, uh, uh, in Indonesia, where we've launched the digital commerce site, and we've launched it in a couple of other places as well, but in Indonesia, uh, just two weeks ago, SoftBank and Sequoia Capital put some money into the number three player at a valuation that blew our minds away because, you know, we're the number two player and we didn't even think that it was worth that much. So from a value perspective, over the long run, I think actually that's where it's gonna be. Our core business has an EV EBITDA multiple of, I don't know what, eight to 10, right? Uh, a lot of these companies have EV EBITDA multiple the pulse of about 30, 40 X, right? So we're basically trying to ensure that those assets are actually a little bit distance from, uh, distant away from our core business and then ride on those multiples. 